Well, good morning, Griffith. How y'all doing today? Good. I was. Are we sure? Are we sure we're good? Good. It's awful quiet. Let's try that again. How are y'all doing today? Fine. Uh, it's still quiet. All right, we're just rolling with it. It's one of those dreary, bleak, rainy mornings. But we're glad you made it. Glad you're here with us. If you would please stand and join us in worship this morning. be seated. Good morning. You hear it all right? We're going to change it up a little bit. Instead of having an announcement at the end of church, I'm going to start doing them in front of church when I say welcome everybody. How are you doing this morning? Good to see everybody. If you're a visitor with us, you want to fill out one of these little blue cards in the front of you, just put it in an offering plate or give it to me or Zach and we get to know more about you. Um, but as far as analysis, it's not many, but if you look on the back of the bulletin, you'll see us, uh, our Bible study at 1030 on Wednesday. We started that back. And also the house huddle, instead of 530 this week, it is 6 o'clock. And um, uh, I don't think there's any meal or anything like this, so it's at 6. And um, for every young is on Tuesday, 
uh, January the 10th, and then there's a men and uh, women's breakfast a little later in the month. But always on the back, I'll just kind of read them along with you, and, uh, and we can go from there. But again, good to see all of you on this rainy morning. Thank you. Let's turn with me to Psalm 51. It's good to see everyone this morning. I'd like to read for you. I was talking to someone the other day uh, just about um, that song uh, as we were singing it. There's this uh, app, and uh, it's also a website, or it's an app if you want it, and it's called relight.app. So relight, as in like relight the flame or relight.app. Um, and it goes through some of the great catechisms and confessions of our faith. Um, and one of them is the Heidelberg Catechism, which every now and then I'll pull out for you. And let me just read what it says. What is thy only comfort in life and death? That I with body and soul, both in life and death, am not my own, but belong unto my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who with his precious blood has fully satisfied for all my sins and delivered me from the power of the devil and so preserves me that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Yea, that all things must be subservient to my salvation and therefore by his Holy Spirit, he assures me of eternal life. And makes me sincerely willing and ready henceforth to live unto him. Um, that song we just sang is pretty much a nutshell. That first question of the Heidelberg Catechism in a nutshell. What is our only hope in life and death? That I am not my own, but I am bought with the precious blood of Christ. I'd encourage you to check that app out. Check out that website. And i like to just go through and see what different Christians have thought over the last couple hundred years and how they've confessed their faith in Christ. And so I'd encourage you to do that. But this morning, one thing we want to be doing is we want to confess our faith through Christ's mercy on us, through God's mercy on us. And that's going to be found in Psalm 51. Now, as you know, I'm challenging you over the next couple months to memorize Psalm 51. Okay? Long portions of Scripture. This gets into our heart and it changes who we are and how we see Christ. Um, and so the last, I think, I think it was last week, last week we read uh, verses 1 to 11. Let's finish up with 12 to 19. Now here's what I want to encourage you church to do. If you can memorize 1 to 11, that's your goal. 1 to 11 is the goal. If you want to go the extra mile, right, do the whole chapter, okay, right? Okay, but just at least 1 to 11. Try to do that. And if you can't do it also, what we'll do Two, we will start to confess this as a church publicly. Well, we will have it on the screen and you can read it, but we'll encourage you to memorize it without the screen and maybe we'll throw in a few Sundays where uh, we don't have it on the screen just for fun like we did a few times before, okay? Um, let me read uh, verses 12 to 19 of Psalm 51. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Let's pray today. Father, may we be a church. May we be a people. Father, who help sinners return to you. Father, may we know the heart of the transgressor because the heart of the transgressor is our heart. We are not far from them. We are not different from someone who is, who is lost and far from Christ because we were once like them. But Father, may we be so close to you that our sin becomes all the more apparent and we know our sin. That may we return we will help the sinner return from there, Father. May this be on our lips as we sing aloud. We have a tongue that will sing of righteousness, filling our hearts and our minds and the people around us. Father, Lord, open our lips this morning that we will sing and declare your praise. Father, it is not, it is not a delight in sacrifice that you are after. 
Father, it is not of our own effort and our own ability, Father, that pleases you as a, as a, a fragrant offering, Father, but you are after a contrite spirit, a broken spirit, a contrite heart, oh God. You will not despise that. Father, may we be as King David, who even after his sin, Father, had a heart just like yours because of his desire to come back to you. Father, we are not here to be perfect. We are fallen creatures. Father, but we're here to, to praise you for you making this fallen creature righteous in your standing because of your son, Jesus Christ. So remind us of that this morning. May we sing your praises aloud. May your, your praise ever be on our lips this morning. And may we be mindful of what it means to follow after you as a body of believers. In Christ's name, amen. Let's stand together and uh, let's continue in song this morning.
God in all his innocence. You're walking in the dirt with you and me. Yeah, he knows what living is. He's acquainted with our grief. Man who sorrow, son of suffering, blood and tears. How can it be? There's a God who weeps. There's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. to God in heaven your blood still speaking your love still reaching all praise King Jesus glory to God in heaven your cross my freedom your stripes my healing all praise King Jesus glory to God in heaven your blood still speaking your love still reaching all praise king jesus for me to god forever your cross my freedom your stripes my healing all praise king jesus for me to god for today and thank you for the fact that we have a God who knows our needs thank you for the fact that you are a God we can turn to when we are in need whenever we are troubled brokenhearted, you draw near to us. I pray that today as your word is brought before us, that you just be with Zach and give him your words to say.
you, I think, are going to enjoy today. I think. I'm not sure yet. This whole, the next couple weeks are risky, all right? And we'll see how it goes. Um, as I was studying the book of Judges, I thought to myself, maybe we should have done Joshua first, right? There is a strong connection to these two books, and, uh, but I thought Judges is still good for us to jump into, and um, we're going we're gonna to do it. We're going to do it. Uh, a few things. Uh, let me just say, say once again, praise team, thank you guys for doing that, leading us in worship. Uh, Keith, thanks for jumping on board. Keith's our drummer, just j- coming in when he can. It's really great to have that. It's been a great asset. Uh, so you make sure if you haven't said hey to Keith, that's Carly's dad. So make sure you say hey to him and thank him for doing that. Um, in the back, you don't need this today, but I went ahead and put it out. Uh, there's a map of uh, the book of Judges, where the judges were placed in Israel, what was going on. Um, you can pick that up. If you can't read it very well, it is kind of tight, uh, small letters. I might find a bigger one later, but let me know. But you can pick that up. And then also there's what I, what's called the Judges Cycle. And we don't get into the Judges actually until chapter 3. So we, it's going to be a while before we get there. But it is good to know that that is a possibility. Uh, you can kind of see that. And it kind of helps you just kind of understand what's happening with every judge. And it's just this, resi- this cycle that's just over and over again. And it's struggle. Before we begin, let me say, uh, as far as announcements go, uh, Griffith Elementary School has something they call Griff Gents. Right? I talked about this a while ago, how uh, they're helping fifth grade boys transition from boys to help them become young men. And they need, young, they need older men to come help them do that. Okay? And so uh, the first one's going to be January 11th. I'm almost positive it's in the morning. Um, I, I, let me, I'll double check that. But January 11th, I'll send out an email. I'll, I'll, I can check from my messages from the uh, principal and let you know. But if, if men, if you're interested, uh, they just kind of, sometimes they do things just kind of, hey, how to tie a bow tie, right? How to be presentable, how to dress appropriately. Uh, for some of the fifth graders that are over there that don't have male role models in their life. And so we're going to hopefully come on board and just maybe let that be a start for our church to do that. So if men, if you're wanting to do that, want to help out, uh, it's January 11th, and I'm pretty sure it's in the morning uh, as school starts, they do that. Uh, Mr. Adams is the guy who's leading that over there, and so we want to jump on board and help out. Um, another thing you can do at Griffith Elementary School is you can go in and you can help read to kids. You can read to kids. Anyone can do this. Right? You can read, you can be, it don't matter your age, right? How, as long as you can read, right? You can come in there and just read to kids, and that's something they need help with as well. And so uh, we, wanna, we don't want to create more work for them, but we want to come along and help them in their endeavor. So that's with Griffith Elementary School, um, some things that we're going to be hopefully working on in the future. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's it as far as announcements Anything I needed to add to that? Oh, no, there's one other thing. On the back table, so you know, hopefully you guys have read, right? You've started your journey of going through the Bible this week, right? If you start in Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, on the back table, the, uh, I put out the entire year, the reading plan for the entire year. So then you don't have to wait for me to give it, or if you want to jump ahead, feel free to do that. Uh, maybe you had, I had to catch up on Saturday. Uh, I, we painted the downstairs room. We got, there was uh, calcium coming through the walls on the, uh, the old choir room, and the, I can show you some pictures. I mean, it was chipping off. You just touch it, and like the paint would chip off. So we, we repainted that, and we were really busy this week doing some of that work, and I appreciate those guys who were able to help. Um, but I missed a day. Okay, that's okay. You miss a day reading. That's it's not bad, right, if you get a few days in there. And then, um, and then you can catch up on Saturday, or even if you miss two days, you can catch up Saturday, Sunday. So I like this reading plan because it's, 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 It's short, sweet, and to the point, and it kind of helps us get through the story of the Bible without getting uh, stuck in the weeds sometimes of the Bible, which those are good, but it is difficult, and so we want to help you read your Bibles, not make it more difficult. Okay, so you can find them on the back table, Um, and then I hope to have some more resources coming for you so we can walk together through reading the Bible, so even if you're not, like, even, well, I can call my wife, my wife, (laughs) we were sitting in bed, she's like, last night she said, uh, she said, is it okay if I don't do the reading plan for church? I said, yeah, it's okay. You don't, you don't have to do it. Like if you, as long as you read the Bible, like that's, that's our goal. It's, but I, wanted, I want us to do it together if you want to help us, and I'll, I'll be right there along with you. So, but if you have something else, read that too. Um, another reading plan. That's, that's a good one. Okay. Let's get into Judges. <laughs> I think what I'll do is I'm going to read the passage after I explain some of what Judges is about. Uh, I don't want to be a running commentary, right? There's so much information, and you could read Judges a hundred times, and you're going to miss something. 
we are so far removed from the culture of the judges that um, of the tribes of Israel that we, we like the idea of a king. And so sometimes King David resonates with us, King Solomon. Like this idea of a monarchy makes more sense. But Judges is the wild, wild west, right, of ancient Israel. I mean, you got all these tribes who are trying to vie for power and they're trying to get, get the Canaanites out of the land or the Hittites out of the land. And they're all fighting. So you got Judah, right, Asher, Naphtali, um, right, Reuben. All these tribes are, are they start off kind of together as a team and they end up at the very end of the book, we'll find that they start attacking each other, right? I mean, it's the wild, wild west, okay? And it's not a book for the faint of heart, but it's an important book, not just for the history of Israel, but it's an important book for the church. And I want to I explain this to you. Does anybody know who Cardinal Ratzinger is? Cardinal Ratzinger. Anyone know who Car Ratzinger is? Raise your hand if you do. I'd be I'm really interested. I didn't know who it was. Does anyone know who Pope Benedict XVI is? Right? Hope, okay, you know the Pope. Hopefully you know the Pope. Right? They're the same guy. They're the same guy. Okay? Pope uh, Cardinal Ratzinger was the Cardinal first, and he became Pope Benedict XVI. He's one of the only popes who has passed away, uh, or who gave up his uh, position of the papacy before his death. Okay? Um, I think I have a picture. Is there a picture of that cardinal guy? Okay, yeah, there he is. All right. So he's the pope. This is the guy who was just in office. Off the, I say the office of, of the pope. Uh, right before uh, the most recent uh, pope is there. He gave it up in 2013, I believe. His funeral was just a few days ago. So it's very odd that the current pope has to do a funeral for the last pope. That's very rare. And that's, that's actually, I think that's never happened if I'm correct. I might be wrong with that. So that just happened a few days ago. He passed away. Um, now, I want to be clear from my uh, evangelical stance as, as a Protestant, if you will, that I do hold that the office of the papacy is a made-up office. <laughs> I don't believe that is something the Bible holds to in Scripture. And, um, but, but I want to be very clear, because of our Christian heritage and because of Catholicism's influence in our world, it matters who is the Pope. It matters who the Pope is. And we should be uh, aware of this and be able to talk to people about this. It, let me put it this way. It matters what he says about certain issues. S so much of the world will follow after his teaching. What I like about Cardinal Ratzinger is that he was a defender of the faith and he stood for conservative Catholicism for a long time. In fact, he was known as God's Rottweiler, is what they called him. I love that. Like, he was God's Rottweiler. Uh, somebody else gave him that name. He was a defender of objective truth. It's one of the things he fought for in his, uh, as the Pope. He argued against moral relativism and theological relativism. Ratzinger was crucial in intellectual defenses of the sanctity of life and the integrity of marriage. <laughs> While con what we want, Mike Consol, is conservative uh, ideologies and conservative Christianity, we, <laughs> most of our argumentation, even today, was dependent upon what he did in the 60s and the 70s. He, he ushered in the value and the importance of life in the womb. <laughs> like he, was, he was crucial in getting Christianity around this rallying cry. Ratzinger was concerned about the faculty in Germany, in Frankfurt, in 1968, during the uprising of scriptural authority in Germany. He was, he was influential in making sure that the staff and the faculty of the schools in Germany held on to biblical authority. And so what I want you to see today and what I want to encourage you about is that leadership and what, what Cardinal Ratzinger was so good at doing was making sure that leadership matters. Who is in position of a leader is, is crucial for the church. It's crucial for everything that happens. And he was a guy who did that for Catholicism. And the book of Judges is a book for the stout a book of Judges is for those who can stomach it. <laughs> it is for those who can continue on even though there is great difficulty, great fighting, and great wars. That's what Judges is about. Who's going to lead when it gets really hard? 
Who's going to lead when it gets really hard? And let me say this. Essentially, the book of Judges is a book for nobody, right? Nobody should look at the book of Judges and say, I love this book. Like, it's not a fun book, okay? But we're going to dive into it for 16 weeks, okay? It's a 16-week. I've already planned it out. We're working through it. And uh, we'll hopefully finish it up uh, right around the time of Easter. Uh, we'll see what happens. But uh, there's uh, 13 judges, and so we're going to go through them as well. Um, but in being a book for nobody, it's a book for everybody. Because when you read the book of Judges, there's a subtle theme of progressing, it's a subtle theme of progressing. Everybody is getting worse and worse and worse. Every new judge, Israel is going down this really slippery slope. And it's not good. It's not good. There's, there's times of renewal. It's like a judge dies and we're like, okay, maybe this is Israel's time to come back and obey the Lord. But they don't. <laughs> they fall right off the slope, all right? This book is thus quite negative. It begins bleakly. It continues darkly, and it ends horribly, okay? Now who's excited, right? Don't be excited. Ultimately, though, it is a book on leadership, or I should say the lack of leadership. This is what this book's about. It will help us see the examples of the judges that leadership changes people. The people will become, listen, here's the beauty of it. What Judges shows us is that the people will become like the leader, people will become like the leader. And this is a truth woven in our time and culture. This is, why it, this is why when we elect officials, policies and character both matter. They both matter. We can't just say, oh, I like the guy's policies, but I don't like his character. The argument doesn't fall flat because when we follow after a leader whose character is bad, that goes the way of the people. Now, if you're 75, okay, I'll be honest with you, you might not know the effect of a leader's character. Because it's going to take generations for this to cycle through. And this is what Judges sees. I'm more worried about the leaders we elect and their character because it's going to affect my kids more. And it's going to affect me more. So I think through it a little differently. Now policies matter, character matters, who we elect matters. But what Judges is going to show us is that the way the leadership goes, the people go. The way the leadership goes, the people goes. Okay? So, most importantly, Judges 5.19 this is the crux of the, of, the, of the passage. Judges is for those who love the Lord and are like the rising of the sun in its strength. Judges 5.19. Keep, just keep Judges 5.19 in, in, in the back of your pocket because it's this beautiful kind of poetry and it's trying to emphasize what God's people are supposed to do in bleak times, right? Those who love the Lord are like the rising sun in its strength. And that's really, that's kind of the theme of the whole book, if you will, um, in a verse, in a nutshell, in a nutshell. Um, so this, is a, this book is a constant reminder and good challenge for us. Here's the question. Are we with the things of Yahweh or are we for the things of us? That's the question that we need to ask ourselves. Are we, are we things of Yahweh, right? God himself, God's name, how he presents himself. So what happens when people forget to pass on to the next generation the ways of the Lord? We're not going to, I'm just kind of giving you some, some, this is all introduction to the book, so it won't be like this every Sunday, okay? All right. I think, I think what this, what this book's going to help us answer the question is, is why do we follow after Jesus? This book's going to help us answer the question, why do we actually do it? Is it because of nostalgia? Is it because we've always done that since we grew up? It's because I've done that my whole life? But none of these things earn God's favor, what they should do is they should get us to ask the questions, why do we do what we do? Why do we do what we do? Uh, like I mentioned earlier, leadership matters. It matters for us. It matters for Roman Catholicism, right? It matters in our seminaries. It matters in our churches. And it also matters in the life of Israel. I want you to think about it. Judges is important for another reason. David, well, really King Saul is going to inherit this mess. When you think about King David and you think about King Saul, this is what they had to work with, right? And they're coming in and they're bringing order to chaos for all they had to do. Every time we elect a new leader, whether it's a president or somebody, I'm always like, man, I would not want that job, right? Because think of all the stuff he's got to work through and the people he's got to work with. It wouldn't be fun. David's going to have his hands full and Judges helps us see where David is going. So, placement. Let me, Judges takes place over about 180 years is our best guess, okay? Um, 
And so it's the time period between, right, you got Moses getting the people out of Egypt, right? He dies. Joshua takes over. Joshua begins the conquest. And there's, we, the timeline isn't perfect, so we think that Judges and Joshua overlap a little bit just because of what's being said. But then after uh, Joshua, here comes, who's going to lead next is the question. And then the book of Judges comes onto the scene. All right? And so I just want to kind of give you a place. And it's looking forward to the monarchy, to the kingdom. Okay? So th- that's going to be where we're at. Don't worry. Like I said, every Sunday won't be this detailed in information, but I want you to understand this. The culture's questions, think about this. Most people in our culture today, when they have problems with Christianity, they go to the book of Judges. They go to questions like, um, why is it that God wiped out entire nations, right? If he's a loving God, right, why is the God of the New Testament different than the God of the Old Testament? They always go to Judges, because Judges is a very violent book. And so, I'm not going to answer that question today, but I, but I want, you to, want you to see some, I'll, I'll hint at it a little bit, um, but I do, want you, I do want to give you a caution against violence, okay? A caution against violence. Our, our culture right now is a very violent culture. Like, when I say that, what I mean is we enjoy violence in some ways, right? We enjoy MMA fighting, right? We enjoy uh, seeing another guy beat another guy up. Uh, it's very popular today. We enjoy things like this. We enjoy watching videos. Our, our movie shows are extremely violent. The things on Netflix and the things in culture today, extremely, extreme violence. I want to... Judges is not a book to be like, oh, it's in the Bible, this is awesome. Push back from that. That is not the goal. Most of the stuff in Judges, in the first 10 verses, right, we already got toes and fingers being chopped off, okay? Don't revel in that. And I want you to know, I don't revel in this. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say, just because it happened in the book of Judges doesn't mean it's supposed to continue, okay? <laughs> right? This is very clear for you to understand. And the challenge for us is not to whether we identify with the violence, but whether we can identify with the theology that frames and interprets it, right? Why did, why did this violence happen, okay? And so what will we see? We'll see that these judges have a purpose. Um, what is a judge? When you think judge, you might think what? Supreme Court, right? Uh, the court system, something like that. You need to be thinking uh, deliverer, okay? A judge is someone who delivers uh, a, a, a post-Moses, right? He delivered them out of Egypt. A judge is just someone who's continuing that. Or you could say that a judge is a hero, He's someone who's a hero, and so you'll see that as well. All right, put this uh, next slide on the screen. It's already on the screen, okay? Um, you'll see this Judges 1, right? This is where we're at today. This is just going to give you the landscape of the book of Judges. This is what's happening. It's an overview, if you will, but it's more from a political point of view or like social point of view, like what's happening socially in the people's lives. Then you start to see the religious decline, and then we jump into the major and the minor judges, right? Okay? And then you have the religious collapse. And then once again, you see the socio-political collapse at the end, okay? So it's kind of like a bookend, if you will. Kind of goes down, the judge's action, and it comes back to show you what's happening, okay? The question is, where is the leadership during the time when Joshua leaves, when he dies and he conquers the land? The question for judges is, why aren't they able... Let me put it this way. In the book of Joshua, the question on the table was... Uh, how much land are they going to conquer? Okay, how much land are they going to conquer as you, as you read it? And then for the book of Judges, the question you want to ask is, um, why aren't they able to conquer the land? Why aren't they able to do it? Okay, this is important. Okay, so let's read Judges 1. Like I said, that was a 10-minute introduction. I promise you the points aren't that long, but uh, these are important to understand. Uh, we're going to read verses 1 to 7, and then we're going to jump around a little bit. So just stay with me, okay? Verse 1, after the death of Joshua, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, who shall go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? There's the question. Joshua's dead. Who's going to lead us? Okay. Verse 2, the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given the land into his hand. And Judah said to Simeon, his brother, come up with me into the territory allotted to me that we may fight against the Canaanites. And I likewise will go with you into the territory allotted to you. So Simeon Simeon went with him. Then Judah went up gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand, and they defeated 10,000 of them at Bezek. They found Adonai Bezek at Bezek and fought against him and defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Adonai Bezek fled, but they pursued him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and his big toes. And Adonai Bezek said, 70 kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off used to pick up scraps under my table. As I have done, so God has repaid me. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and he died there. Jump down to verse 16. 
Sorry, verse 11. Verse 11. Uh, the story of Caleb here. From there they went against the inhabitants of De- uh, Debir. Uh, the name of Debir was formerly Kiriath Sefer. And Caleb said, He who attacks Kiriath Sefer and captures it, I will give him Aksa, my daughter, for a wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, captured it. And he gave him Aksa, his daughter, for a wife. When she came to him, she urged him to ask for her father for a field. And she dismounted from her donkey. And Caleb said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Give me a blessing, since you have sent me in the land of Negev. Give me also springs of water. And Caleb gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. Um, for sake of time, jump all the way to uh, verse 34, the last couple verses of chapter 1. The Amorites pressed the people of Dan back into the hill country, for they did not allow them to come down to the plain. The Amorites persisted in dwelling in Mount Herez, in Ajalon, and in Shalbim, but the hand of the house of Joseph rested heavily on them, and they became subject to forced labor. And the border of the Amorites ran from the ascent of Akrabim, from Salah, and upward. Verses 2, 1 to 5 of chapter 2. Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgah to Buckham, and he said, Bo- sorry, that's Bochim, and he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their God shall be a snare to you. As soon as the angel of the Lord spoke those words to all the people of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept, and they called the name of that place Bochim, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. Um, Next week, I will have scripture readers. Anyone interested? It gets better, okay? Um, I'll be honest, half those words I made up. Okay, so I did not pronounce half them properly. Don't think I did. Uh, that one word, bokeen, though, that's an important word, and so I did, I did get that one right. Um, so don't feel like you have to get that right if you want to read. Um, here's my first point. God's people need God's leader. God's people need God's leader. The book of Judges begins us looking to the past, right? It opens with Joshua and ends with us looking to the future, Right? The final words of the judges are begging and longing for a king. If you look at the end of Judges 21-25, it says this, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Judges, <laughs> judges the book of Judges is written in, in a way that says, let's get out of the book of Judges as quick as possible. <laughs> right? Read it thinking of the past of Joshua and his greatness. And when you get to the end, be looking to the future king, the monarch, right? King David, King Saul, King Solomon. It's coming. Now, it's interesting that in the Bible, God does this regularly. Exodus, how does Exodus begin? Anybody know how the book of Exodus begins? With the de- who dies in the book of Exodus in the beginning? Joseph. Exodus begins with the death of Joseph. Joshua begins with the death of Moses. Judges begins with the death of Joshua and First Kings begins with the death of David. This is a very common theme throughout the Bible. When somebody dies, make notice. This is important. Joshua was the chosen successor to the greatest prophet there ever was, the Bible says. Joshua's got to follow in the footsteps of who? Moses, the deliverer of Israel. And what was special about Joshua is that he and one other person were the only people in all of Israel who were at the time of Egypt and able to see the promised land, right? Everybody else died in the desert. They wandered for 40 years, but only Joshua and Caleb, which we're about to read, right, were the ones who were able to come through and see it to the other side. And so what the book of Joshua is going to help is that God keeps his promises, leading his people to bravely open and worship him. But this one phrase sets the scene for the entire book. Joshua dies. That one, that sets the entire scene, right? If you're an Israelite reading Joshua dies, you should be freaking out. Like, what are we going to do, right? And this is exactly where they find themselves. That's a loaded statement. The people have gotten so far under Joshua's leadership. What will the marker be of success? And so if we're Bible students, what was, what was Joshua's success? If you don't mind, turn to Joshua 1, right? Let's go back to the beginning of Joshua, verses 3 and 4. How did Joshua measure success? 
verses 3 and 4 of Joshua 1. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward the going down the sun shall be your territory. Jump down to verse 7. Only, only Joshua, be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may have good success wherever you go. I love verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Joshua's goal, right? The goal of Joshua was two things, twofold. Take the land, get up obtain the land, that was success, from, notice it was from the Lord, and two, make sure your military victories are surrounded by a close and humble spiritual life, a close walk with God. Be careful to obey and meditate on it. If you obey the law and you're getting the land, you're successful. If you're being courageous by, by fighting and winning and you're sticking close to God while doing it, success. That's the mark of success, and that's the mark of success for judges. And this is it, though. The job of Israel as they take over the land is the same. It's covenant faithfulness. Be faithful to God as you take over the land that's been promised to you. But this is the struggle from here on out, right? Our leader has died, and we need to know who will show us the way. God, Joshua's dead. What do we do? The opening statement is designed to make us think about that previous leader. What were the people to do under new leadership? Well, go see what that other leader was doing, right? And that's in, in Joshua 1, okay? Uh, if he gives the church two charges, it's to be courageous and stick close to God. If I could do that in practical, be courageous and stick close to God. When you decide to follow God and become a disciple, church, this is for you. When you decide in, in, to become a disciple, what do you think your life should become? Easier? Should it, should it be filled with roses and daisies and f times in the, a flowery field with the sun shining on you and a glass of sweet tea, lemonade all the time maybe? No. When you become a disciple, your moments of joy become more difficult. That is totally wrong. Disciples are risk takers who look out at the world around them and say, the blessings of God are worth whatever is gonna be thrown at me. Whatever comes your way, disciples say, it's worth it to take the risk. And this is, what, this is what's so hard because bravery slips through our fingers when we don't have faith in God. It slips through our fingers when our faith is in more on the sight of the difficulty situ difficult situation than it is on the one of who our faith is from. The strength of our, here's how I put it, the strength of our faith should depend on the one who our faith rests in, not the amount of our faith. If you have a weak faith, that's okay. If you're struggling today and you're saying, I don't know, I, I'm struggling to like follow after God today. I know he's right, but I'm just struggling in that area. Your faith's enough. Your faith is enough. This is what we learn over and over, particularly what Jesus does with people of little faith. But what we see in Judges is there's a progression of halfway followers. Halfway followers who are going down the, the slippery slope. Judges should be a measuring stick, if you will. It should measure whether the people are obedient to what Joshua was told to do. But it isn't until chapter 2 where God actually gives his evaluation. Right? Chapter 1 is just this happened and this happened and this happened. But chapter 2, God shows up again and he says, you stink. <laughs> you stink. <laughs> All right? What kind of people are we when, as we will see in the future, everyone does what's right in our own eyes? The book of Judges is clear and tells us what that will be. So, here, here's where I want to be. Judges 1, there's nine tribes, nine tribes, and how, they ha how will these nine tribes handle a lack of leadership? Don't worry, we're not going through all of them. I'm already kind of closing out here. Um, chapter 1 is going to show us what these nine tribes do to get in a difficult position. But there's, there's key points that are going to happen that I think I want us to focus on as the church. First off, unity around the things of God brings the presence of God. Unity around the things of God brings the presence of God. If you can show me a place where the people of God are unified, I will show you where God dwells. 
Okay? Verse 3, what does Judah do? Right? So we talked about Joshua. We're jumping all the way down. Who's going to fight for us? The Lord answers, Judah shall go up and fight for you. And so what does Judah do? He says, Judah said to Simeon, his brother, come up with me into the territory allotted to me that we may fight against the Canaanites. Judah asks the other tribe for help. Now, some people might think this is bad. I don't think it's bad because any time, if you look at verse 17 and 22, any time that Judah asks for help or if there's a unifying cry around the mission of God, God gives them the victory. And so I don't think this is a bad thing that Judah does. I think he, he's asking for help. I do not think this is a formula for winning, right? I want to be careful. We're not just saying, hey, we can win as long as we're unified because we can be unified around the wrong thing, can't we? We can. God was working through his people when his people joined together. This is an important start to the book of Judges because what you're going to see is that unity begins to break up over time. And so eventually it just leads to civil war. Okay, within their own ranks. So anytime you see unity in judges, it's usually a good sign. Um, let me encourage you, church. Our church should thrive on mutual assistance. Mutual assistance. One of the very reasons you have me and I have you is because we thrive together. Now, I'm still, I'm, sometimes I have the mentality of I'm just gonna get it done and I'm just gonna do it, right? I need people to help me see it's better to work together. You need that for me, that it's better for you to walk in your faith with the church in mind, with the believers in mind. You don't do this alone. We will see in Judges that when Yahweh's people assist one another, they receive Yahweh's blessings, okay? Paul writes in Ephesians 3, 17 and 18, we talked about this a few weeks ago, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, what, what may happen? that you may have strength to comprehend with all the saints, with all the saints, what is the breadth and length and height and depth. Here's what he's saying. You can't fully understand the love of Christ without Christ's people. If you're trying to follow the Christian life alone, you're missing a portion of God and probably a really big portion of loving God. You can't do this alone. You do this with the church. Some might say, oh, you need each other because you are weak. No, we are saying we want to experience every possible ounce of God we can. And for that, we need each other. For that, we need each other. I think unity is one of those things that's kind of falsely advertised. In 2021, Bruce Springsteen was on the Super Bowl ad. Does anybody remember that Super Bowl ad with Bruce Springsteen? Where he went to the middle of America. Has anybody ever been to the middle of America? 2021, right? We just went through 2020. Right? And so Bruce comes along and he's, he's with Jeep, right? Jeep was the, the advertiser and he's driving this old fashioned Jeep and he gets to the middle of America. And in the middle of America, there's this little tiny church. I don't know if you've ever seen it. You guys can watch this. Um, and he says, uh, the, the quote from the, the thing is, We are reuniting the states of America. Do you remember that? If you remember that Super Bowl ad, if you watched it, I like Bruce Springsteen. Um, I think my only issue with the, the ad is like, I don't even, what are we uniting around? What are we uniting around? And we, I think he missed the point. Israel, well, the beauty of what Israel does is Israel knew its fight. Judah, the tribe of Judah, knew what they were fighting for, for the land that God had promised so they could worship him freely, they could get out from idolatry, and they knew it. Church, do we know ours, though? Do we know ours? It's willing to fight for, we, we should fight for some things, but we've got to make sure when we fight, we fight in unity, and we've got to know what we're fighting for. I love this picture of the ants, right? You, you ever seen ants are uh, able to do amazing things and they're able to, to pick up objects that are much bigger than them as they work together. Um, but they're also able to like come together and build bridges that weren't typically there. And the Bible says things like this, like how, how valuable is the ant? How much can we learn from the ant? Go to the ant, slugger, just for laziness. Go to the ant, you lazy man. Learn how to work his ways. He is good. Listen, church, we can differ sometimes on how we get things done like the process that we get there, the best way to accomplish it, how fast we should go or how slow we should go. But you know what we cannot disagree on? We cannot disagree on our purpose and our mission. We cannot disagree on our values and our vision to reach this community. If we disagree on that, we are on the wrong foot. Now how we get there, right, everyone's got an opinion. But we cannot disagree on the mission. I will never understand a marriage between two people who want to divide their finances. Don't do it. Who want to split their life to a degree. When you get married, everything you have is the same. 
<laughs> Griffith, let me encourage you that whatever my vision is for this church, and I want to be careful about this statement, as your pastor, I want you to pray that God would make it your vision. I want you to pray that God would make it your vision. Now, this isn't me just overpowering and saying, you got to be with me. But, but, when, but I, 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 if I don't believe it's from God, I shouldn't say it. But if I believe that we should reach this community the way we should do it, and, and you want to jump on board, and you're like, I don't know about that, pray that God would change your heart. I'm praying that. I'm not just saying, hey, this is it, and we're doing it no matter what. I'm asking you to come with me. Come with me in that. We do this together. Okay? I'm not going to get through all of Judges, so just stay with me. Let me, let me get through this next little point. Uh, verses 4 to 7, this story uh, so, so, sorry, unity around the things of God brings the presence of God. Here's a little sub-note. What's interesting about Judges 1 is that it's the story of the tribe of Judah for the first, like, 20 verses, um, but there's little, like, caveats. And one of those caveats is uh, this, this king whose name is Adonai Bezek who gets his toes and fingers cut off, okay? So, uh, but here's what's, so, here's what's good about this passage, okay? In some ways, I don't think how Israel did it was right, I don't think God is saying, hey, this is what you should do for everybody. But even Adonai Bazak, if you look at it, he understands that this is a form of justice, right? He, he knows that God is repaying him for what he did. And what we're going to find is that when God comes and wipes out nations in Canaan, they understand that they deserve that. Like some people don't like the fact that God told Israel to get Canaanites out of there. He didn't tell them to destroy them all. He said, just get them out of the land. Some of them needed to be destroyed, but they needed to be destroyed because of their evil and their wickedness. It was, in some ways, God's, God getting Israel to attack Canaanites was a form of justice in and of itself. Why? Because even this bad king says, Adonai Bezek said in verse 7, 70 kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off used to pick up scraps under my table. He, he's saying, I did the same thing to somebody else. He's saying, the Lord just give me back what I did to somebody else. It's justice. When, when the bad guy knows that what he gets is justice, you know it's justice, okay? And this is what's happening in Canaan over and over again. Um, so that's just a little side note, but that, those little stories pop up uh, throughout the whole book of Judges. Um, and let me, close, let me close with this story and we'll... I'm not, yeah, I'm not going to finish this up. Let me close with this one. Uh, if you look at the story of Caleb, I love this. Uh, he, and here's the charge of, of the book of Judges, right? Be courageous. Go for it. Be courageous. Take the land. Don't hold back. Here we have a faithful few asking for a bigger promise. A faithful few asking for a bigger promise. Remember, what's the charge, according to Joshua, that every Israelite has? Be brave, go get the land, drive out the idols. Be brave, go get the land, drive out the idols. Every Israelite is to do exactly what Othiniel does. What happens here? Verse 12, and Caleb said, He who attacks Kiriath Sephir and captures it, I will give him my daughter. And this really wise guy named Othiniel, Oth Othniel, the son of Canaz, he's like, that sounds great to me. <laughs> I'm on it. <laughs> the author is, is, is doing something here. In the middle of the triumph of the tribe of Judah, right, this, this long uh, kind of story of Judah's triumph, there's one small, particularly really brave family. There's one little brave family that's like, we'll do whatever God tells us to do. And it's the family of Caleb, Right? Who, who took on the spies, right? We know Caleb's story from Joshua. If you know it, don't, don't worry. If you don't know about it, don't worry about it. But here's what's beautiful. Caleb offers his daughter for anyone who can attack this place and become victorious. I love this because this should have been an easy win. This should have been an easy win. You guys ever see those Capital One commercials? Like it's an easy choice. Put the screen on a uh, picture on the screen. There's this one I really like where the coach is on the, the bench in the, the baseball team and he's like, uh, we need a pinch hitter in this moment. Uh, Derek, you're up. And this like little, this guy stands up and you can tell he's like this really small dude. And, and they're like, the coach is like, no, no, Derek Jeter. <laughs> and Derek Jeter's in the back. And it's like, who are you, who are you gonna, it's an easy choice, right? If you, have, if you have Derek, the guy who, you know, works at, you know, I don't know, the grocery store and you have Derek Jeter, who's gonna be your pinch hitter? It's Derek Jeter. It's an easy choice. Capital One does these commercials. They're really funny. I, I love this because this is what's happening when, um, when Caleb comes and he says, who will take this land? Who will take this land? You know why it's an easy choice? Because God's already claimed victory over it. God's already claimed victory over it. Be brave and take it. 
Be brave and take it. This guy, Othniel, apparently is like, you mean to tell me that if I obey the Lord and take the land, I get the land and I get a bride? Easy choice. I know it. I'm going to go for it. I'm in. Now, listen, this isn't advice, I think, for how a, uh, a father should find a husband for his daughter, but I do think there's something important here I want to point out. I think Caleb, as one of the most faithful men in all of Israel, he knew that if this man will be faithful to God in taking the land, he'll be a good husband for my daughter. And so he says, whoever takes the land, that's who I want my daughter to marry. Whoever's faithful to God, that's who I'm going to try to get my daughter with, right? Now, I don't think that's what the, the text is teaching us overall, but I think it's a principle that we can find from God's word that men, if you are looking for your daughter to marry somebody, man, find the guy who's going to be faithful to the Lord. Find a guy who's going to be faithful to the Lord. More than he can provide money or a steady future for her, make sure he is obedient to God. Um, I love this story because what happens is through Othiniel does the right thing. Even though he does that, he doesn't go far enough. And it takes the daughter to step up and ask for even more blessing, Right? This is the charge of every Israelite. Look out at the land and take it. Take it. Go for it. Don't hold back. Be brave. Be courageous. According to verse 14 and 15, somehow the daughter, Aksa, is the faithful one. When God gives you a vision, church, don't go. Once you capture it, if you see something else, don't stop. Don't let it be halfway. Don't stop with one when two are in sight. Don't stop with one blessing when two blessings are in sight. This whole narrative is a slap in the face to every Israelite who's about to read this. You mean it's, it's the wife who actually gets the, the land of the water? Look at verse uh, 14. What, uh, and when she came to him, she urged him, speaking of Othiniel, to ask her father for a field. And she dismounted from her daughter. And Caleb, the father, said to her, what do you want? She said to him, give me a blessing. Since you have sent me in the land of Negev, give me also springs of water. I want more. I want more. This is the, the challenge of this daughter, and she does this so well. What you and I need to do is ask if we are being faithful to God's call in our lives. What are you doing right now to see God move in your life? What are you doing to see God's hand in your life increase? Don't stop and be complacent. Keep going. Be courageous. I really think of the younger generation, right? I think of the younger person, in, maybe in the audience today, um, I'm not necessarily saying that uh, you may want to be a YouTuber for Jesus. That's not what I'm necessarily saying. But what I am asking you is, when you look at your life, young person, and you think, man, what's my future hold? Right? Where am I at? Uh, maybe you want to be a YouTuber. What, what I want you to think through and what I want you to think about is, how is this helping me become made into the image of God? It's not, it's not that being a YouTuber is, is, I think it's a little odd, but people do it nowadays. They just film themselves and they make lots of money, right? You can do that. What I want you to ask is, though, is how is what I'm doing transforming me into the image of God? And if it is transforming you into the image of God, 100% go for it. Go for it. Be brave in that decision. If you got half a million subscribers, how does that see God's plan increase in your life? Is your plan for you or is it for God? That doesn't have to be a YouTuber. You don't have to have millions of subscribers. It could just be something simple that you have a passion for. Is your passion transforming you into the image of God? Go for it. Go for it. Be like the daughter, Aksa, who does this. And here's my last point. How are you serving God? Does your service to our creator build up resentment in your heart? Is it damaging your relationships, your family? Do you dread serving the Lord? <laughs> stop doing it. That's my encouragement. You stop doing it. It, is, it will be a drain on your life. You, if, if, if you serve God and you have problems with it, you either have a heart problem, a motive problem, or a purpose problem. I'll close with this. God is not shaping you by your ability to do something for him, but his ability to do something through you. That's how God shapes you. And that's what Axa saw. She saw the, the rivers and she said, I want it. Even when Othiniel wouldn't ask the dad for it, the father-in-law for it, Axa would. And I love that, okay? It's 12.06. Let's close in prayer and be reminded of what God is doing. Um, 
It's an odd place to close. That's not where I was going to land, but we need to, we need to close today. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Uh, the book of Judges is filled with stuff, and I'm already finding it difficult to get through. Would you help me, guide me through this book? Uh, our staff and Father, as we think through and pray through what it means to, to take all of your word, the whole counsel of God, into our lives. And so may Judges be a great book to remind us of, of leadership and um, follow what the church is to be. Uh, help us now, help us to be challenged by the bravery of, of Athenio and Axa. Father, help us to re- remember of, uh, that we need a leader. We're not without a leader. We need someone like Joshua. But Father, when that leader dies, who will we look to? Father, we look to you. We look to Christ in all of our victories and all of our life. And so help us do that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. Let's sing this song and close. Um, there wasn't a strong gospel presentation, but if you heard God, God speak to you today, we read Psalm 51 today. If you want to know what it means to have righteousness in your life, to be, to be changed by the gospel, I'll be down front. I'd love for you to come talk to me. You can come pray at the altar if you like to. Uh, we encourage you to do that this morning. As the song is being played, you come if you'd like. Uh, let's sing this together. What love could remember, no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. would wait as we constantly roam what father so tender is calling us home he welcomes the weakest the vilest the poor our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the lord his mercy is more He lavished on us His blood was the payment His life was the cost We stood neath the debt We could never afford Our sins, they are many His mercy is more Praise the Lord His mercy is more Let's pray, and we will be dismissed. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love, your kindness. Father, it is faithful from generation to generation. But Father, may we be faithful to proclaim that greatness from generation to generation, to remind them of that loving kindness. Father, that what is our hope in life and death? God alone, go away this morning. Father, your church dismiss into the mission field, reminded of that call in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You are dismissed.